Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Thursday Thought, I want to talk to you guys about something that some would consider to be dangerous, maybe even blasphemous, and that is how you, you can converse with angels. It's something that I've been doing since I was a kid, and it's something I feel very impressed by the Spirit to share with you. But I want to start off by reading a scripture as to why it's not something we should be afraid of. In Doctrines of the Saints, section 5b, verse 63, which would be Doctrine and Covenants for Community of Christ, 104, 10, uh, 107, 20, for the uh, Salt Lake City Church's Doctrine and Covenants. And I'm just going to read a portion of this. The power and authority of the lesser or Levitical priesthood is to hold the keys of the ministering of angels. So basically, the moment I was ordained a deacon at the age of 12, I held the keys to the ministering of angels. If you have been ordained to at least a deacon, then you have those keys also. But in church, we're not really taught what to do with them. But I believe that they are important because in lectures on faith, and this is lecture 7, uh, verses 17 Q and R, all things were made in subjection to the former day saints according as their faith was. By their faith they could obtain heavenly visions, the ministering of angels. So this is something that was a part of the religion, of our religion, for the former day saints. And we see this when we read the Book of Mormon, we read the Bible, and it's something that people expected and we know happened when the Church of Jesus Christ, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was originally organized and existed from 1830 to June of 1844. So why aren't we taught to do it now? Well, I don't want to get into that because that's that's a bit more controversial than I'm, I'm willing to discuss. But I want to go over a couple of, of key things here, some questions people have asked me, and I'm hoping that in this video I can help you figure out how to do this correctly. And, and I want to preface this by saying, please watch the whole video because there are evil spirits out there and you can be deceived. And I'm, I want to also teach you how not to be deceived. So the first thing that you need to understand in order to do this is that this, this mundane realm, as some people call it, this world around us, it's, it's, not, it's not everything. I don't want to say that I can, I can prove this to you, but I'm, I'm going to, in air quotes here, prove this to you. I'm going to suggest some ideas of why this is this is true. I know science has told me and I believe science that my eyes can only perceive a certain range of visible light. Right? Bacteria is so small that people didn't know that it existed for a very long time until we got microscopes. I could see it. So the reality is that our finite human perception can't see everything. It can't perceive everything. Now that does not prove that angels exist, but it suggests that the people who say that they see them might actually be seeing something. Now, whether that is their imagination or a trick of the light or an actual entity, that's another conversation altogether. What I want to do right now is open your mind to the possibility that it could be true. And as Alma says in the book of Alma, it's, it's, it's like a seed. It's a little bit of faith that you need to plant in the soil and see what grows. And so I want to I want to express to you one of the questions I'm asked is and and not just like Dave how do you know this for yourself but people ask me how do I know this for myself I need to know this and that question is how do we know the difference between our imagination and the actual holy spirit actual angels actual demons actual other entities and this is a really, really good question that we have to explore first. Otherwise, we can be deceived by, by our own minds, by ourselves. For me, 
this is a question. I mean, it, it's something that I wrestle with constantly because you have to know that it's real or, or it, it can't happen. But at the same time, you also have to doubt so that you don't trick yourself. I, I don't know how to say that any, any clearer than that. So I want to start off by saying that I can close my eyes, right? And I can picture in my head whatever I want. I can picture myself flying. I can picture myself sitting on a, a, a very grand chair, a throne. I can picture myself eating. But when I open my eyes, I'm not really there. It's obviously my imagination. The, the, the food that I ate, it didn't make my belly full. I'm still hungry. And so that's obviously my imagination. When you are in the presence of an actual spiritual being, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit or making a connection with the Holy Ghost, there's a feeling that it's, it's just, it's different. And I can describe it as a burning in the bosom. I can describe it as independent thoughts, independent voices that I don't have control over, which again, that can be insanity. But the feeling that I get, that overwhelming peace, that overwhelming love where anybody could do or say anything to me and I just love everybody so much that it would just wash over me like it didn't even happen. That for me is how I know. I, I remember as a kid being bullied and there were times when I, you know, as a little kid, I would tear up. I would be so upset because it was so painful being hurt. But when I'm in that spiritual zone, I love those people and I just want the best for them. And all the pain that they caused me is just completely gone. It just doesn't exist. And even though they set themselves up to be my enemy, I truly, genuinely love them. It isn't a, yeah, I love my enemies. It's, a, I, it's, it's, it's something written in my heart. It's a part of who I am. And I'm not saying that it's not who I am when I'm not in the spirit, but I'm saying it's easier to get there when I am in the spirit. Because without Christ, I am imperfect. So the first thing we have to figure out is that that feeling, because that's a big part of building your relationship with God. And so it has to be key. You can have a theological idea of who or what God is or the reality of God. But if it's merely your rational thoughts, then another rational thought can convince you that you're wrong. So uh, uh, keeping with my, my, if I think of food, I eat, but I'm still hungry. When I'm in the spirit, I am spiritually full. It feels different. I, I have this connection. And I know that some people like to call it a frequency or under certain vibrations and, and those type of things. And, and I don't know if I would use those terms myself. I, I don't think that my, my body vibrates in a certain way or anything like that. I, I think that I'm just connected to the spirit. And so because of that, my spiritual eyes are open because we're not just a physical being. We're also spiritual beings. And so our spirits have, for lack of a better word, organs. We have eyes. I don't know how or if or what we breathe, but something comes in and out of us. And so when we connect to the spiritual realm, instead of just closing my eyes and imagining a hamburger and eating it, my spiritual eyes open and I see something that's actually there that I can't necessarily see with my physical eyes. Now, how do I... How do I tell you how, how you get to get into that zone? That's the next part. 
One of the problems that we have in my mind, this is from my perspective, as human beings is it's we feel like we're owed something. And in order to reach out and touch the spiritual world, the spiritual realm, whatever you want to call that, you can't believe that you own it. And yet at the same time, you have to understand that you're a part of it and that it's a part of you. So let's look at it like this. I'm a parent, so I'm going to come at this from the perspective of a father. I go to the mall with my kids. We get separated, right? Well, now when I look around, I don't, I don't see my family anymore, but I need to find them. How do I do it? I can go and ask someone on a loudspeaker to you know, announce throughout the mall if they have a system that will do this for a certain person to come to a certain place, right? And in, an, in one sense, that's prayer. And so that can, that can work, that can help. But the other part to it is that they're my family. I have a connection to them. I recognize them. I do, or at least should know, when we left the house that morning, I know that they're wearing shirt, pants, socks, shoes, and I have a general idea of what their clothing looks like and probably what they're wearing that day, right? When we walk off, I, I mentally remember that image. So that feeling that you have, there's that connection there, that, that familiarity from your personal relationship with God and also your spiritual memories from the pre-mortal world because it's a real place and you were at one time there even though there's a veil before our eyes and we don't remember it and I do know that not everybody watching these videos believes that we existed before this so I'll say it another way for these brothers and sisters that, that view things differently than I do if you don't believe that you existed before you were born then you, when you were born, were still created in some way by God. And so therefore, a part of that divine essence is in everything. And so that connection will connect you to the spiritual world because you weren't just created physically by dirt and evolution and your parents. You had to come to life. And that's more than just electricity flowing through our, our neural pathways, through our our nerves and spines and muscles. It's more than just the flowing of blood. We have a, a spirit. We have a soul. And that soul had to be created by something. And so therefore, the soul must have been created by God because where else would it, would it have come from? And so we should have that spiritual connection. But then we run into a problem. I have a son who always wears black shoes, black pants and either a black shirt with a black hoodie or a black shirt with a black jacket and his hair looks like hair on a lot of people not just boys but people his age and there was one time when i was actually driving to pick him up from school and i was running late and so he had started walking and i'm driving i'm like oh there he is Oh, no, no, that's not him. That's him right there. Oh, no, no, that's not him. That's him right there. And so you have this problem of identifying, is it the right person or not? But when I found him, I knew it was my son because everything clicked and I felt it. That's my child. That's the, the young man that I love. It has this connection to me. It lives in my home, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing. When you reach out to the spirit world, there's more things there than just the angels, than just the Holy Spirit. And I want to share a couple of scriptures with you here. One is from the Bible, and I have tested this, and I've talked about it in other videos. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. And here's how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. 
And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Now that's uh, 1 John 4, 1 through 3, if you like to read the whole thing. But I can tell you that this test works. And the reason why it works is because perdition may know it, but they can't testify of it. They can't confess it in the same way that we can as Christians or as the angels can. And I want to also share with you uh, from Epistles of the Saints, this is um, the sixth book of Joseph, or Epistle of Joseph. It's called Testing the Spirits. And in chapter one, so basically this would be um, where the Salt Lake City Church's uh, section 129 from the, from the Doctrine and Covenants, this is where it came from. And so it's not going to, it's not going to be exactly the same because they made some changes to it to make it work with what they were putting together. But what it says is, in verse, starting in verse five, when an angel of God appears unto a person face to face, in as looking like a, a physical being, and reaches out their hand, and takes, and you can take a hold of the angel's hand, and you'll feel a substance, just like a human person shaking hands with one another. Then you will know it's an angel of God. And at this point, in my mind, it's pretty clear that that's a resurrected being. And it says in verse six, verse six, such personages or angels are saints with their resurrected bodies. So then in verse seven, we read, if a person appears and offers his hand and the man and, and the person tries to take hold of it and feels nothing, there's nothing there, then you know it's a deception. And the reason why is because a, a devil can't tell the truth. So in verse eight, it says, or when a saint whose body is not resurrected appears unto a person in the flesh, they will not offer them their hand because it's against the law given them. And it says that keeping these things in mind, we may detect the devil that he deceive us not. And I can tell you that this works. When I met Raphael, I shook his hand. He had a physical form. When he laid his hands on my head to ordain me, I felt physical hands on my head, weighing down my hair. And anytime I've seen a spirit, a, an angel that was not resurrected, they would never offer their hand. And I'm not going to get into the darker side of things. I have had experiences in those, but I will tell you this, that it is correct. You will go through them. They won't stop you. And they won't testify. They, they literally can't testify to you that Jesus is the Christ. And if you raise your arms to the square and you command them to leave in the name of Jesus Christ, they don't have a choice. They will leave gnashing their teeth, but they will leave. That power is real. There's another part of this that I want to share with you that, that I've discovered that I'm not sure is directly in the scriptures. But if you believe that it is, I would love to hear that scripture. So please share it in the comments below. And that is this. The other reason why I like using my example of myself and my son is that when I'm in the mall, it isn't just me looking around. Where's, where's my family? Where are my kids? It's also them looking for me. And it's important that we understand that these angels, the angels of the Lord, they want us to see them. They want to minister to us. They want to work with us. And I think that's why this Thursday thought today is so important because we've been told to ignore them. We've been told not to look for them, not to listen to them. And how can we be a prophetic people if we don't take the simplest of the keys given to us through the low priesthood and actually use them? I have a friend who collects scriptures. And one of the things that he shared with me that he finds interesting is that my, my story of where the, I see the plates of brass, how I go into a cave and there's a table and there are plates there and I read them. I'm not alone in sharing that story. There are other people who tell the exact same story and we don't know each other and we don't even know of each other. I only know of these other people because this friend of mine shared them with me. 
I would love to meet these people. I would love to discuss these things with them. Because the more we talk about our spiritual experiences, I believe the greater our faith grows and the more spiritual experiences we will have. So I want to wrap this up by saying a couple things. One, the spiritual world is this world. It's, it's, it's here. It's real. And number two, you not only can make contact with it, but that world is reaching out to us. That's why we're born again. That's why we feel the Holy Spirit. Because they want us to know the reality of Jesus Christ in a special way, and they want to minister to us. Number three, they're not the only ones there. They're not the only ones trying to reach us because there are deceivers and they, they want to trick us. They want to lead us away from Jesus Christ. Four, the power of Jesus Christ is the greatest power ever anywhere in the universe. All beings will submit to it. The angels are already have already submitted to it. And the demons will be cast out by it. And lastly, all of this is predicated upon your faith in building that personal relationship with God and understanding that we are all one big family. Now, if you decide to try some of these techniques, I do recommend you pray. Always, always pray beforehand and afterwards. Cast out all evil from your midst before and afterwards. Be receptive and open to the Spirit. If you want something to happen and you pray on it enough, then what ends up happening may be deception. So you can't just pray for what you wish and what you want. What you're really praying for is what the Lord wants. So find out what that is and pray for it. Never forget the 116 pages that were lost because Joseph Smith kept going to the Lord and saying, hey, I know you said no, but we really want to do this. They thought they knew more than God and they were wrong. And look what happened. The Lord prepared a way. But there's a lesson there for us. It wasn't necessarily better. And it was a little harder. Because Joseph didn't listen. So make sure that you're seeking God's will in this thing and not your own. If you are familiar with these experiences, if you've had these experiences, please feel free to share them in the comments or reach out to me, info at cjccf.org. I'd love to talk to you about them. And if you are seeking these experiences and you want someone to talk to, you want guidance and help, I, I am here for you. Again, info at cjccf.org. But I want you to know that these things are real. And that's my Thursday thought, and I leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.